Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about video games. Today I'm continuing with my favorite games of all time, this time covering numbers 35 to 31. 35 is a fantastic indie puzzler that asks all kinds of interesting sci-fi questions. The Swapper was developed by Facepalm Games and first released for PC in 2013. It's a puzzle platformer that lets you play an unidentified astronaut who must traverse a huge, mostly empty space station. Gameplay revolves around the Swapper device, which allows you to create clones of yourself, which will mimic your actions exactly. The device also allows you to swap your consciousness into one of the clones. The puzzles start off simple, but quickly become more challenging. Eventually, it's not just a matter of positioning, you also need to navigate around obstacles and make use of gravity, momentum, and timing. The story is not only about trying to escape the space station, but also learning about an alien civilization, the Watchers, who created the Swapper technology. You learn about what happened through security logs, interactions with the Watchers themselves, and from a mysterious voice over the comms. The narrative and gameplay are equally engaging and really enhance each other. Things get rather philosophical as the game raises uncomfortable questions about the nature of life, identity, and the mind. Are the hundreds of clones you create and casually discard in order to reach your objectives just empty vessels? When they fall to their deaths or are dematerialized, does it mean nothing? Can a mind jump from body to body with no adverse effects? Next is one of the scariest games I've ever played, which makes excellent use of a camera. Fatal Frame 2 Crimson Butterfly was developed by Tecmo and first released for PS2 in 2003. It's a classic Japanese survival horror game where you play twin sisters Miyu and Mayu. The girls find themselves trapped in an abandoned village, haunted by spirits, and learn the truth about the mysterious Crimson Ritual. The only way to combat these spirits is with the Camera Obscura, which will show you both friendly and hostile ghosts. Seeing the camera filament start glowing means something is nearby and is immensely creepy. Fatal Frame 2 has all the aesthetic trappings of good survival horror. Creepy, slow-moving twins, fixed camera angles that make you paranoid something is going to appear from just out of you, and music that can make your skin crawl. When a ghost is near, the picture even takes on a staticky film grain effect. This is one of the scariest games I've ever played. Had I been playing alone, I would likely have quit like I did with Silent Hill. However, this was one of the survival horror games I played through with a friend, taking turns with the controller, and I have lots of good memories of being scared together. And a few memories of having the controller thrown at me in terror when something particularly scary happened. 33 is a cinematic adventure that takes on all the tropes of a teen horror movie. Until Dawn was developed by Supermassive Games and released in 2015 on the PS4. It is a very cinematic adventure game that follows around a group of teenagers who have come together in a remote cabin on the anniversary of the disappearance of two other friends. As you can probably guess, things start to go bad, and depending on your choices, people start dying. The game uses a butterfly effect mechanic that changes the course of the game, as well as who lives and dies based on your decisions and how well you do at quick time events. Of course, you don't have quite as much control as the game first leads you to believe. Characters can really only die at a handful of certain points, but even smaller things, like how two characters behave towards each other, can be impacted by your choices. I had a ton of fun with Until Dawn. It's full of scares that had me jumping, then laughing at my own reaction. 
Though the story isn't exactly groundbreaking, it was exciting to see it play out, and having characters based on such obvious tropes made it easy to love them. Or love to hate them. I ended up playing through Until Dawn multiple times so I could see the different way things could happen, and it's even fun to watch someone else play. The next game is a bit of a cult classic that tells stories within a story. Alan Wake was developed by Remedy Entertainment and released on Xbox 360 in 2010. I'd call it an action thriller. It dabbles in survival horror, but doesn't really fit into that category. The story follows novelist Alan Wake, who is suffering from writer's block and takes a vacation to a quiet town with his wife Alice in order to try to get some writing done. Alice disappears, and Alan finds himself surrounded by shadowy figures called the Taken, and experiencing the events from one of his thrillers, but one he doesn't remember writing. There are so many things I love about this game. The Pacific Northwest setting is beautiful and feels real. The pacing is fantastic. It's broken into episodes which are full of cliffhangers, and you're never doing any one thing for too long. It goes from Alan being alone in the woods and fighting the Taken, to exploring populated towns and meeting the locals, to traveling with a friend, and experiencing great set pieces like fighting Taken with pyrotechnics while listening to Viking rock. One particularly great chapter has Alan in a mental institution, but one that is miles away from the usual asylum trope seen in horror games and movies. This one is filled with other creators who have lost their mojo and are struggling to create. Alan Wake manages to be spooky and always make it feel that something is off, without being outright scary. It also has a fantastic soundtrack, with each chapter end being punctuated with songs by the likes of David Bowie, Roy Orbison, and Harry Nelson. Sadly, expiring licenses for this music caused the game to be pulled off digital storefronts, but if you haven't played it and find a physical copy, I highly recommend it. 31 is the Final Fantasy game that I had the most fun playing, though some see it as the beginning of the end for the series. Final Fantasy X2, or X2 if that's your preference, was developed by Square and released for PS2 in 2003. It's a JRPG and a direct sequel to Final Fantasy X, after Yuna has completed her pilgrimage, defeated Sin, and lost Titus. Yuna has shed her summoner past, and together with Riku and newcomer to the series Pain, is part of a spear hunting group called the Gullwings. The three women fly all over Spira, taking jobs and having adventures. I know a lot of people found this game silly, especially after the rather serious and somber story of Ten. But I really liked getting to see a different side of Yuna, getting to hear her narrate the story, and the game's mechanics were ridiculously fun. Combat is all based around dress spheres, which would equate to the jobs of early Final Fantasy games. The characters can equip multiple dress spheres and switch between them at any time. There's the basic thief, warrior, and white mage, but also much more unique jobs, like samurai, lady luck, and mascot. This added so much variety to fights, and brought out my love of spreadsheets when I made one to plan which character would master each job. This isn't necessary to play the game, I'm just a nerd. Plus, this meant so many outfits. For each dress sphere, each character got a unique look. The Gullwings had access to an airship right from the start, so you could travel wherever you liked, whenever you liked, and I thought the mission-centric format worked really well. That's it for this episode. The next one has selections that span 24 years of gaming history, and more than a few zombies. If you missed it, check out the last episode in this series, or another of my videos. I have a Patreon if you're interested in supporting my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.